everyone to class. That means it's time to stop talking. Yeah, you guys look up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dibble. All right, if you would, get out your Bibles and open up to Psalm 12. If you would, get out your Bibles, open up to Psalm 12. Uh, you should have in front of you a set of notes titled Lesson 32, Preservation, Examining the Relevant Passages, Psalm 12, 6 and 7, Part 2. Uh, so two weeks ago, uh, we, were, we looked at the first part of a discussion on Psalm 12, and we didn't do anything with this last week, obviously, because Becky and I were out of town in uh, Maine. By the way, that, that all went well. We had uh, a good trip, and the flights and everything were on time, and so uh, we, didn't, we didn't encounter any problems that way. So it's good to be back with you this morning. Just one thing... Um, some of you remember from the when we were doing the Grace History Project that I had said at that point that we were Dr. DeWitt and I were working on a book on J.C. O'Hare. I posted on Facebook last night that we just got a uh, full rough draft manuscript from an editor for that entire book. Um, so that project is nearing a time when it will be completed. We're going to have to have that reviewed and edited and so forth and a a cover a front and back cover design but that that project is still going on I was talking to uh, my brother Merrick there and he said he had forgotten all about the fact that we were doing it well probably others have too but it is still going on and it is still in process and we're hoping to have something put out next year sometime in 2017 if everything goes as planned um, so with all that being said I, I want to get right into the notes today we did start a couple minutes late so Lesson 32. In the previous lesson, we began our investigation into whether or not the scriptures teach a formal doctrine of preservation. Please recall the following three views laid out in Lesson 30. Okay, So I'm going to write these up here on the board again. The first view, or view number one, is the denial of preservation. Okay, This view again says that there is no such doctrine as preservation. This is, so this is a denial of a doctrine of preservation. Okay, the second view, view number two, was the idea that preservation occurred in the TR, Texas Receptus, majority text or King James uh, King James line, okay? And then a third view we, we uh, surveyed was the idea that preservation occurred in the totality, and I'm writing these up here so that we can refer back to them as we go through the lesson, in the totality of the manuscripts, okay? So what we've been doing here first is we've been investigating whether or not preservation is a Bible doctrine versus whether or not preservation is not a Bible doctrine, okay? And we said that these two views, views two and three, differ in terms of the extent as far as um, uh, how far to take preservation, and then they also differ as to the location of where the preservation occurred. But both of these views, views two and three, maintain that the Bible does teach a doctrine of preservation, whereas view number one up here denies that the Bible teaches a doctrine of preservation. So we, going back to the notes then, we commence this process that's into the, the big picture investigation. So let me just rephrase. What we're looking at now are the overall views. Does the Bible teach or deny the doctrine of preservation? And then once we've answered that question, then we'll get into the secondary question of the extent and the location of where that preservation occurred. Okay? So that's, again, just a quick review of the direction that we're going with all this. So we commence this process by initiating an examination of the relevant passages commonly used to teach the doctrine of preservation. <coughs> Excuse me. Our investigation began with Psalm 12, 6, and 7. So just very quickly by way of review, we, re we review, observed the following general points about Psalm 12, 6, and 7 in Lesson 31. First, we saw that many believe it to be the clearest and most important promise in the entire canon regarding God's promise to preserve His Word. Okay? Second, we saw that controversy surrounds the passage regarding who or what is being preserved. We saw that one view says that it's the words, 
And another view maintains that it is the people, i.e. the poor and the needy from verse 5. Okay? And third, we saw that those who maintain the passage is teaching the preservation of the people generally make two arguments to support their position. First, they want to argue based upon grammar. And we spent the whole last lesson talking about gender discordance in the Hebrew Old Testament. And we talked about that gender argument, and that's what we looked at in detail in Lesson 31. Okay? And second, they make contextual arguments. Now, you'll see this clearly in a minute, but I just want to point this out right now. The reason I chose to, do, or to cover grammatical arguments first as opposed to covering contextual arguments first, is because the contextual arguments generally cannot be made unless one is going to make or start off with a grammar argument. Okay? So, I, in my evaluation of all the material that I read on this, it seemed to me that the grammar argument was therefore the more important argument and needed to be dealt with first. Okay? So, as we investigate Psalm 12, we will consider the following points. Grammatical arguments on gender discourse. We already did that in Lesson 31. Okay? So what we're going to try to cover today are the following three points. We're going to look at contextual arguments, or arguments for the idea that it's the preservation of the righteous in this passage. We're going to get, I'm going to offer to you what I believe to be the correct exposition, which, does, which is the preservation of the words. So if there's any doubt about where I stand personally, I do view this as a passage teaching the preservation of the words. That should have been clear from Lesson 31 last time. But then I also want to touch on some of the extreme uses of Psalm 12, 6, and 7 in the pro-King James literature and argumentation. So, the bulk of Lesson 31 focused on point one, grammatical arguments and gender discordance. It was concluded that arguments based upon gender agreeance were inconsistent, irregular, and therefore inadequate for proving that Psalm 12, 6, and 7 does not teach the preservation of the words. Now, we spent a whole lesson on that. I'm not going to go over all that again here today. If you want that material, you can uh, grab the notes and all the things and the videos and so forth offline from that. It's all fully updated. So, in this lesson, we want to focus our attention on points two and three, namely, contextual arguments and the actual teaching of the passage. So why don't you go back to Psalm 12 if you're not already there. Let's look at verse 6. Well, let's read the whole thing. Go to verse 1. <clears throat> Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety uh, from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest, uh, when the vilest men are exalted. So, <clears throat> for the sake of consistency, let's begin our discussion by looking at William W. Combs' essay, The Preservation of Scripture. Combs summarizes the contextual arguments as follows. Just so you remember, the whole breakdown here that I'm using here of the three views we got from Combs' essay on preservation. Okay, So that Combs' essay is sort of a base jumping off point for some of the stuff that I'm covering with you uh, as we go through this material. So we're gonna, we followed Combs first in the last one, so we're going to see what he says first here. Okay, So Combs says the following. He says, quote, David's subject in the psalm is stated right in verse 1. Help, Lord, for the, godly, for the godly man ceases to be, for the fruitful disappear from among the children of men. David is concerned about the righteous who are being oppressed by the wicked of this generation. In the midst of this, he declares his assurance <clears throat> that God will preserve the righteous forever. Taken in this sense, this passage 
has no bearing on the doctrine of preservation. Okay? So what is Combs saying about Psalm 12, 6, and 7? Or what's he saying about really the entirety of the whole psalm? He's saying that it has nothing to do with the preservation of what? The words, he's saying it has to do with the preservation of the people. Now, that should not be a surprise to you because that's what we saw him saying last time when we looked at what he said about the grammar issues. Okay? So, in other words, according to Combs, the context of the passage is about the preservation of God's people, not the words of God. Okay? Edward W. Glennie, or W. Edward Glennie, I always say that backwards, I don't know why, but I apologize. He agrees with Combs regarding the context of Psalm 12 and offers the following expanded explanation in his essay titled The Preservation of Scripture. Uh, Glennie says following, quote, The psalm is an expression of David's confidence in the pure words of God. That should say in verse 4, that's my typo, not verse 14. In verse 4, he, plays, he prays for deliverance from the, the proud flatterers all around him who cannot be trusted. Verse 5 gives the source of David's confidence. He is assured that the Lord will deliver him from those maligning him. In verses 6 through 8, David declares that his confidence is in God's word. In this context, David's, ex David's expression of confidence in God's word in verse 6 refers to his confidence in God's affirmation that he will deliver the afflicted. Verse 5. Then in verse 7, on the basis of his confidence in God's word, verses 5 and 6, David declares his assurance that God will preserve forever the righteous who are being afflicted by the wicked of this generation. Now, the pronoun them in verse 7, thou shalt keep them, does not refer to the words of verse 6. So what argument is he using there? He's using gender and grammar. Okay, It refers to the poor and needy of verse 5, and the godly and faithful men of verse 1, whom the Lord will preserve. Furthermore, in context, the generation must be the wicked who are all around the psalmist and dominate his society. It would not make sense to say that God will preserve his word from the generation of David throughout eternity. So you see what he's doing there? He's saying that if this is a verse talking about the preservation of the words, why would God preserve his words only from the generation of David forward? Okay, We'll talk more about that in a minute. <clears throat> what about generations before David? Was God concerned about his word then? The point of the psalm is that the godly man is that the godly man will never cease. The faithful will never fail from among the children of men. The righteous will never disappear from the face of the earth because God will preserve them from this generation forever. Verse 8 clinches the contextual arguments. It again returns to the topic of the wicked all around from whom David and future generations will be delivered. Okay, now, a couple things there. First of all, in his contextual argument, does he use the grammatical argument? He's saying that the pronoun, that the, the, the plural pronoun suffix them in verse 7 has to have a match, and that has to be the, plur, the plural pronoun suffix the needy and the poor from verse 5, like we saw from last time. Okay? So his contextual argument, embedded within his contextual argument, is the grammar argument that we saw last time in our last study. Okay? So let's go to page 3. First, it is important to note, and I guess I kind of already said this, but we'll just read it. It is important to note that Glennie's contextual argument is predicated and dependent upon the grammatical argument regarding gender discordance. We've already concluded in Lesson 31 that grammatical arguments based on gender accordance are inconsistent and inconclusive. Consequently, since Glennie's contextual argument is so grammar dependent, I find his exposition based upon contextual consideration to be inconclusive. Second, to argue that since David states from this generation forever in verse 7 
means that God was not concerned about the preservation of his word before David's generation is not a sound argument and, and disregards a host of relevant cross-references. Hold your hand there and come over to Exodus 24. So understand what he's saying. He's saying that cannot be talking about the preservation of the word because he's only talking about from the generation of David forever. And then Glennie is making the assumption, therefore, that God didn't care what happened to his word prior to the time of David. Now, again, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because of the section in the quote there where it says, it would not make sense to say that God will preserve his word from the generation of David throughout eternity. What about generations before that or before David? So see there that Glenny is making an assumption regarding what that verse is saying. Look at Exodus 24 verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and rose up early in the mill, uh, morning, and built an altar uh, under the hill, the two pillars, according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, what is Moses writing there in verse 4? The words of the Lord. The words of the Lord. So, are we going to say then that God didn't care about what happened to these words Moses wrote, just because the verse in Psalm 12 is saying, particularly talking about from the dead generation forever. That's the argument here that Glennie is wanting, is, is, is putting forth for his readers. Okay? Go to Isaiah 30. Well, why would, God, why would God have Moses write something in a book? Or write all the words of the Lord? Isaiah 30, verse 8. talking about, uh, he, it says here, now go write it before them at a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come, how long? Forever, Forever and ever. So why would, why would God have Moses write all of those words in a book back there in Exodus 24? So that once they're written down, they'll what? They'll, they'll exist forever and ever, right? So God inspires Moses. Moses records the word. And the whole reason God's having people write things in a book is so that they'll be available to man forever and ever according to the, the relevant cross-references. So go back to Psalm 12. So in Psalm 12, David is speaking from the, from the point of view of the Scriptures that he's in the process of penning. Okay, when he makes this statement from this generation forever, he's in in the immediate context of that statement. He's talking about what he's writing as he's writing what, writing Psalm 12. That the words he's in the process of writing, God's going to preserve from the generation that they're being written in, the generation of David. How long? Forever. Okay. Third. There. Third. Where are the relevant cross-references to support Glennie's contextual interpretation that God's people will be perpetually preserved in an earthly sense from evildoers? Now, Beverly, you brought this up two weeks ago. I don't know if you remember when you asked that question, but I told you we were going to talk about it this time. God's people continue to suffer many things at the hands of wicked men, even in the dispensation of grace. While there are no cross-references to support the notion that God will preserve His people from evildoers, there are ample parallel passages to support the teaching that God will preserve His word forever. If, God is, if this is talking about the preservation of the people here, as Glennie and Combs are asserting, then why don't we see that preservation actually occurring in history? Okay, That is a problem that is created when you, when you take... Number one, the grammar argument, and then couple it with the contextual argument, okay? Because, again, in my opinion, the contextual argument is largely dependent on the grammar argument. And then we, we've got a whole bunch of verses there regarding uh, preservation. One of them we just read in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8. So, Combs and Glennie are not the only writers to deny that Psalm 12, 6, and 7 is referring to the preservation of God's written word based upon grammatical and contextual arguments. John, how do you say this guy's last name? Rurik? John Rurik's Preservation of the Bible, Providential or Miraculous, the biblical view, uses Combs, Glennie, and J.J. Stewart Pernown's commentary on Psalm 2, Volume 1, to argue similarly. He states, 
This passage does not speak about the preservation of God's written word. It only addresses the purity and trustworthiness of his words and the preservation that is being spoken of concerns the righteous men. Okay, so again, this is an argument that is out there, and this is why Psalm 12 is a debated, hotly debated passage. Because it is at the forefront of this preservation controversy, as, um, and there are some that you know, are, are, are interpreting it one way, and others that are interpreting it a different way. So after considering the relevant writings, it is evident that grammatical and textual arguments are working in concert with each other by those who seek to deny that Psalm 12, 6, and 7 are teaching the preservation of the written word. Okay? So we've got, we've got a grammatical argument working in concert with a contextual argument by those who seek to deny preservation. Now let's just take stock of it for a minute. Wallace and Glennie take view one and they deny preservation outright. They say there is no such doctrine as preservation, okay? Combs is taking the third view. Now remember what we saw last, last study in lesson 31. Combs does not maintain, based upon gender agreements and based upon context, that Psalm 12, 6, and 7 is talking about the preservation of the words. He thinks it's talking about the preservation of the people. Yet, in Psalm 119, verse 152, where you have the exact same gender dis discordance and so forth, he says that verse does teach the preservation of the words. Okay? So we went over all those things in that previous study. Okay? So there's, there's the side that's saying, no, this is teaching about the preservation of the words. And then there's the other side that's saying, no, this is talking about the preservation of the people. So what I want to do now is look at, the, look at some of the arguments that are used by the other side here about the... So I'm not going to pull any punches here. I believe the passage is referring to the preservation of the words. Okay? I believe that's the correct understanding of the passage. Preservationist Thomas M. Strauss acknowledges that the King James reading of Psalm 12, 6, and 7 stands in contradiction to that of modern versions. Now, remember last lesson I put that chart, those charts on the screen and I showed you in black and white that that was the case. Okay? But they don't agree about how these verses should read. Okay? Strauss views the passage as one of the clearest promises of preservation in the Old Testament. He says, quote, Psalm 12 is a psalm of contrasts. It contrasts the godly with the ungodly and the words of the Lord with the words of men. Later contrast, uh, the later con latter contrast, excuse me, provides the backdrop to one of the clearest promises in the Old Testament of the preservation of God's words. So, Strauss is taking the exact opposite position of Combs. He's saying that this is teaching about the preservation of the words, not the people. Okay? Now here's, let me just say, Stra uh, uh, Glennie, Wallace, Combs, are these guys all high academic credentials with PhDs? Okay? Strauss, um, uh, Pickering, some of the other brethren, are they high academic professors with credentialed PhDs? They are. So there's scholarly dis divergence here, right? So you could, you could get out your cards and you could play scholarly poker and see my scholars won and so forth and we could get into all that and make it all about what they're going to say or we could try to understand what the verses say. Okay. Now we've looked at that, let's look at the other side of this. So Strauss sees the psalm as one of asymmetric contrasts. The structure of the psalm is asymmetric, he says. The structure causes the focus to be on C, God's promises, C below. We'll look at it in a minute. David's lament carries the reader from the need for divine help because of the words of the ungodly to focus on the, promise, the promises of God for deliverance, which include the permanent preservation of his words, the anecdote to the words of the to the words of the ever present wicked. Okay? So he's got A, the recognition of the need for divine help. Look at verse 1. Help, Lord, 
For the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. So that's the, that, that is uh, indicative of the recognition of the need for divine help in this situation. Okay? Then B, the threat of the words of the ungodly. Look at verse 2. They speak vanity. So if they're speaking, what are they speaking? They're speaking some words, right? They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. So David is, in verse 2, he's focusing on the vain words of these wicked men. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us? Okay, so go back to the notes. Strauss sees the threat here as the words of the ungodly. Okay, and then the, what is the anecdote to the words of the ungodly? What's the answer? What's the solution to the words of these ungodly men? It's the words of who? It's the words of God. Look at verse 7. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith who? The Lord. the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. So what Strauss is saying is that verse 1 it is recognizing the need for divine help. Verses 2 through 4 are identifying the threat as coming from the words of these ungodly men. Verse 5 is identifying the anecdote. What is the anecdote to the words of these ungodly men? It's the promise of who? It's the promise of God in verse 5, okay? And then he, uh, God, it's God's promises in verse 5. Then verse 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So the, the, ad, the, the answer to the words of the ungodly in verses 2, 3, and 4 are the promise of God in verse 5, Okay? The promise of God in verse 5 is the, is the anecdote, it's the answer, because God's promising in verse 6 and 7 that He's going to preserve those what? Those words. That those words that are the answer to the sighing of the needy and all this stuff, that He's going to take those words and He's going to what? He's going to preserve them. Okay? And then finally B ends it with the recognition of the need for divine help. When it says, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest of men are exalted. So, without reproducing the totality of his article, Strauss draws his reader's attention to verse 5, or statement C above. He says, the structure of the psalm focuses on the promises of God. The Lord promised that because of the oppression of the poor and of the sighing of the needy, he would arise and set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Since the poor were despoiled and the needy were groaning, the Lord made significant promises. Okay? Psalm 12, now look at Psalm 12, 5 close. Look at Psalm 12, 5. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. Now will I arise, saith who? So, folks, whatever is going on here is based on something that God what? Said. Said. Does everybody see that in verse 5? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. So has God made sufficient promises to the poor and to the needy here? Okay? And how has he made, how has he made these promises? He's made these promises through what he has what? Said. Through his word. Through what he's told them. Okay? So go back to the notes. Notice that the protection of the poor and needy is based upon what the Lord said, i.e. His words. In the near context, the psalmist has already expressed that the Lord will arise to help the poor and the needy. Hold your hand there and go back to Psalm 9. <coughs> go back to Psalm 9. Verse... 
18. For the who? For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish how long? Forever. Arise, O Lord, and let, and let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy what? Now, is God promising there that he's going to do something for them? Yes or no? Yes. So the promise here is based upon what who is saying. Do the, listen, do the poor and the needy here have any hope outside of the promise of God? Go to chapter 10. Look at verse 12. Chapter 10, look at verse 12. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked condemn, uh, wherefore doth the wicked, uh, condemn God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it, for thou, be, for thou beholdest mischief and spite to requite it with thy hand. The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of who? The fatherless. So let me ask you a question. In chapter 9 and 10, is God making promises to the poor and to the needy? Okay, now go back to chapter 12. Look at verse 12 again, verse, or chapter 12, verse 5. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now watch, for the sighing of the needy, now will I, what? Arise. Did we just read two passages in chapter 9 and chapter 10 where he's promising to do that for them? Okay? Where I will arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Okay? So go back to the notes. The promise of hope offered in verse 5 is only as good as the Lord's ability to perform and execute the promise. Does everybody see that? The, the, the promise of hope offered in verse 5 is only as good as the Lord's ability to perform and execute His promise. So if I am living in this generation back here, and I'm having, and I'm having vain words spoken against me, if I'm having flattering lips in verse 2 speaking against me, if I'm having somebody out of a double heart speak against me, and I'm having, and, and, and I'm having all these things happen, and God gives this promise that He's going to arise, and He's going to do things for the oppression of the poor and the sighing of the needy, in verse 5, if I'm living there, what is my hope in? My hope is in the words that God what? Said in chapter 9 and 10. Okay? So, Psalm 12, 6 and 7, with the promise of God in mind in verse 5, the words of the Lord are contrasted in verse 6 and 7 with the words of the ungodly in verses 2 through 4. Regarding verses 6 and 7, Strauss writes, So what's the problem with the words of men in verse 2, 3, and 4? They're the words of men. Did God make sufficient promises to these people what He was going to do for them? So what is, is, is that any anecdote for what they're going through if God's, not, if God's not going to preserve and keep the words that He promised them? Okay, so Strauss says the following about 6 and 7. The content of God's help was the assurance of His ever-present words with promises of deliverance as an anecdote to the words of the wicked. The psalmist reflected on this quality and endurance of the great tangible help that the Lord desires to give man His perfect words. The quality of the Lord's words is likened to purified silver from a refining furnace. The result of the sevenfold refining process produced 100% perfect silver in the ancient world, an apt illustration for the quality of the perfect words of the Lord. David revealed the endurance of God's words, indicating that they would be preserved from that generation how long? Forever. So, the expression, <coughs> excuse me, the expression from this generation forever reflects that David is referring to the words of hope that he has been in the process of penning. In other words, the statement applies to the words that David is in the process of writing under inspiration. 
attempts to argue that the verse is not teaching the preservation of God's words because it only mentions the current generation and nothing before David are weak and failed to take into account how Psalm 12 fits into the book of Psalms as a whole. I should say as a whole, I believe. There, so we should mark that, Sylvia. Okay? Now, let's just stop there for one second. Does, whether you agree or disagree with Strauss, does everybody at least understand what Strauss is saying? Okay, Strauss is making an argument that this is why this passage is referring to the words of the Lord. It's referring to the words of the Lord because the promise in verse 5 is in what God said. If they can't have confidence in what God said, how is it any deliverance, any refuge from the words of, from the vain words and the flattering lips and the double heart in verses 2, 3, and 4? Okay. Any questions about that? Again, what I'm after here is that you at least understand intellectually what Strauss is saying. So then we get to verse 12, or sorry, verse 8. David concludes the psalm by recognizing his need for the Lord's help, given that the wicked surround him on every side. Look at verse 8. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest of men are exalted. So what is going to be his what is going to be his hope in the midst of that situation? What can David cling to? What can anybody of David's generation cling to? Can they cling to the perpetual promise that God is going to preserve them from harm for all eternity? No. Can they cling to the perpetual promise that God here is going to preserve that which he promised them? So you see the difference. You see how the gender and all of that is wrapped up in all that from what we saw from last time. So, Strauss says about verse 8, David recognized that the proud words of the wicked flatterers were a constant problem, but the perfect words of God will always counter man's lies. Okay? So, without the preservation of the words, what hope do the poor and the needy have of their foretold future deliverance? Listen, if God's not going to preserve what He said to them, then what hope do they have that any of it's going to happen? They wouldn't have any hope that, uh, they wouldn't have any hope that any of the stuff that is promised in verse 5 would ever happen. And this is, this is Strauss's point, okay? Arguing that this passage does not teach the preservation of the words throws the content of the Lord's promise in verse 5 into question. Why? Because the promise of the Lord in verse 5 is based upon what God said. If they can't have confidence in what God said, how can they have confidence that that preservation is going to... That, let me say that differently. They would have no confidence that he, he would preserve them as people if he's not going to preserve his what? The promise that he made in through his word. Okay? So let me finish this point. The expression, uh, that's not where I was. Without the preservation of the words, what hope do the poor and needy have of their foretold future deliverance? Arguing that this passage does not teach the preservation of the words throws the content of the Lord's promise in verse 5 into question. Not only that, as we have already pointed out, the poor and the needy have not been perpetually and supernaturally kept safe from the wicked since the generation of David. Has that happened? If that's what this passage is about, then should we expect to see that having had happened? Okay. So, the entire psalm is about the words of the wicked versus the words of God. In the end, I believe that the passage is teaching the preservation of the words. That being said, I would disagree with Strauss that his promise necessitates exact sameness or verbatim wording. Okay? I believe Psalm 12, 6, and 7 are talking about the preservation of the Word of God. I do not think that they are talking about the preservation of the people. Okay? So, I would, I would agree. I would, be more, I would be more in the camp with Strauss 
than I would be in the camp with combs and so forth. Okay? Does anybody have any questions or comments about any of that? Yeah, Beverly. Well, <clears throat> during David's reign, there was a lot of, it was mostly war, wasn't it? With it was a lot of warfare, a lot of stuff. So, there was a lot of oppression for the people, a lot of wickedness. And so, that didn't change until Solomon came along and things became more peaceful, right? As but, far as the political stability of Israel, right, I would, yes, so like, to a degree. If you read through the Psalms of David, they're, they're, they're talking about deliverance from what they were going through. And, of course, that didn't happen right away, so, but God's promises have stayed true. It's just that those people had to continue to live under that oppression, and like you say, they, they still do, you know, in, in, the, in this world. Even in the dispensation of grace... Are believers persecuted by wicked men? Has that been the case all through the dispensation? So the idea that, that therefore that this is talking about God preserving the poor and the needy from this generation forever, not only do I believe it doesn't match the grammar, not only do I believe it doesn't match the context, I don't believe it's happened in history that that's been the case. Okay, but that you brought that up last time. <coughs> So are there any other thoughts about the first two points before I really dig myself into a hole? No? All right, so then let's, yes, Fred. Yeah, the preservation of the poor and needy in any generation is going to be dependent upon their faith in the Word of God. Right. right. I mean, if they have faith in the Word of God, they're going to be preserved forever. Yeah. Right? As far as salvation is concerned, yeah. you're saying? Sure, certainly. I mean, if, if they trust Christ's finished work, in that sense, they'll be preserved forever, right? Yeah, that's what I'm, I, I'm, not so, I'm not so certain that David's necessarily talking about eternal salvation in this yeah, verse, I don't know that. as yeah. much as he is the immediacy of the, the circumstances that they're in. But even for us, when we're in bad situations and dire straits, what's our hope? Right. Our hope is what? Our hope is in the Word of God. Our hope is not that God's just going to wave a magic wand or whatever and make everything better all of a sudden, right? Because He's promised to preserve us. That's, that's not the way it's gone, okay? But that would have to be a conclusion of that if you're going to say that this is talking about the preservation of who? Of the people, as opposed to the words, okay? So what I, what I want you to see there is how those gender arguments... And contextual arguments ultimately work together there to say that that passage does not teach preservation. I believe that it does. I think the gender stuff is um, inconsistently applied. Uh, no such apparent mandatory rule of grammar appears. More times than not, the Hebrew grammar follows the rule of proximity and near antecedent than it does gender accordance. And we can prove this from a host of other passages also dealing with the scriptures like we did two weeks ago. Okay, So I believe that that is a promise of the preservation of the Word of God. The words of God. Okay. Now, the next point I have here is extreme uses of Psalm 12, 6, and 7 in pro-King James argumentation. So let me just be real clear about it. I do believe... That in the preservation discussion, Psalm 12 is a relevant passage about preservation. Okay? That being said, I think some King James proponents have run too far with the passage in their argumentation. Okay? Many King James arguments hold either explicitly or implicitly that Psalm 12, 6, and 7 is referring to the King James Bible. So, when they read verse 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. They think that those verses are talking about this King James Bible. Okay? In other words, they have in their thinking the notion that David is speaking directly about the King James Bible in this passage. Now, I have read the books, seen the literature, talked to folks 
both in person and through social media that think what I'm about to say to you, okay? So, the expression, as silver tried in a fur furnace of earth purified seven times at the end of verse 6, is taken to be a direct reference to the King James Bible, okay? This argument is made because the King James Bible is the seventh translation of the Textus Receptus into English. Okay? So, 1525, you got Tyndall. Okay? 1535, you have Coverdale. 1537, you got Matthews. 1539, you've got the Great Bible. 1560, the Geneva Bible. 1568, bishops. 1611, King James Bible. Okay? So, the, Bible, the words of the Lord are pure as, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified what? Seven times. So just do the math. One, two, three, four, five, six, bingo, seven. Now, what the problem with that is the King James has been significantly changed since then. I so, mean, you can't hardly read the 1611, could you? Well, you can read it. It's English. I mean, it, the font is in Gothic font. It looks different, but you can read it. I've got one at home. Yeah, and, you know, you can, you, you can read it. It does look, visually, it does look different in terms of its font and some other things. Like, for example, uh, the Gothic font is based heavily on German. So, the, in, in the 1611, a lot of words are capitalized that aren't capitalized later on. So words like heaven are capitalized. Um, all those words are, 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 that's the orthography that they're following back then. But the point is, see, as, as silver trying to furnace of earth purified seven times, they will interpret that then to be a statement about what? The King James. But if it's not there, where is it? I'm not saying, Lee, that this isn't it. I'm just saying when David is writing that psalm, I don't think he has a clue in his mind about an early 17th century English translation. Okay? When David's sitting there writing that, he's thinking about the words he's in the process of writing. He's not talk, he's not looking 2,500 years out into the future and seeing this. Okay? Then, then, then the other ones weren't, weren't, weren't God's word then, were they? Yeah. No, they weren't pure. And then you have another problem. Oh, those people get saved. Because then you have a bunch of revisions that happened between, 17, six, between 1611 and 1769. Now, substantively, is this one here substantively the same as this? Yes. Yes. Is it identical to this in every detail? No, it is not. Well, how different is it is to the bishop and the other ones? I mean, well, I did a study on that, right? Well, yeah, uh, we're going to get to that stuff eventually. But I did a study on the, I did a study for a conference a couple years ago on the textual history that, uh, what did I call that study? I took, I took the bishops in the King James and or the bishops in the Geneva and I compared them with the King James to determine what was the state of, oh, I remember, what was the state of the English text by 1604? That was, that was the, the premise of the study. Because in 1604, when, when the Hampton Court Conference is called in 1604, okay, England is divided between the Puritan faction, which favors the Geneva Bible, and the Anglican fa faction, which, fa which favors the Bishop's Bible. Okay, we don't have time to get into all this detail. We will do that, but we don't have time to do it today, right? So, on the first day of the Hampton Court Conference, the, the Puritans had, their, had a chance to talk to the king, right? And they presented to the king an itinerary of everything they wanted to go over with the king. Guess what was not on the itinerary? A, quest, uh, uh, an, an ask, a request for a new translation. If you read the transcripts, Reynolds throws it out almost like a complete afterthought. And when he cites it, he cites, and his reasons, he cites three passages from a bishop's Bible 
that he thought that he thought were not accurately translated. Okay, now, there's a whole lot of stuff to get into here, but what you're going to find out is that well before 1604, there was already a chorus of voices that were calling for a new translation before 1604 in England. Or a new translation of the Bible into English before King James become, had come to the throne in 1604. I can show you documentation stretching all the way back into the 1850s or 1580s and 1590s where people are petitioning the Queen of England to authorize a new translation. There's actually a petition before Parliament in the mid 1590s that never goes anywhere. But my point is, there's already a, a groundswell in the English-speaking world before 1604 for there to be another translation of the Bible into English. Now, you don't read about that in the majority of the King James only, pro-King James literature, because they're content to just view the 1611 as the magic number when out pops the perfect Bible in English. And what I'm saying to you is, it is way more interesting and way more complex than that. All, now, you may say God's working through all these factors, okay? I, I could see where somebody would take that position. But the bottom line is, when we, by the time we get here, a lot of stuff has happened. And for me, it's my personal, private, subjective opinion that when David is sitting there writing this psalm, I don't think he has in his mind this. Now, you can disagree with me if you want. It doesn't change my fundamental view that if you want to find God's Word in English today, where do you go? I still think you go there for it. But again, like I told you in the beginning, my, I'm still at a certain spot, but my reasons for why I'm there are not what? The same as they used to be. Okay? So where are we at here? The assertion. This assertion is based on the middle of the page. This assertion is based on the numerical argument that seven is the number of perfection. Coupled with the King James having been the seventh translation of the TR into English. Therefore, it is argued that the King James is perfect. In order to make this argument, one must make the following assumptions. Number one, David is speaking about the King James when he wrote Psalm 12. And number two, all the various additions of the six earlier TR translations are not to be counted. Every single one of these, from the bishops on up to Tyndall, appeared in multiple editions. Okay? So are we supposed to count all those two? Or are we just supposed to count the first one? Okay, so you, you, you see what I'm saying. Not to mention the fact, I was dealing with a gentleman. Go to Jude 25. This is sort of my go-to example on this because it's easy. I was dealing with a gentleman last weekend in Maine over some of these issues. Jude 25. <laughs> Verse 25, it says, To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Okay? So, in that verse, the 1611 says, Now, I'm going to excuse a plus sign, and ever. Your 1769 edition says, Both now and ever. Now, does it substantively alter the teaching of that verse if that word both is there or not? No. It's in that one, it's not in that one. So as I was dealing with this gentleman, he goes, well, this one is the seventh revision of the seventh translation. So that's the one that got everything what? Right. right. And he based it on what verse? Psalms. But look, folks, if, I mean, are we going to box ourselves, are our pro King James advocates going to box themselves in so much that we cannot account for the actual facts as they stand in the text? I think that is a mistake. And that is where my thinking personally has changed. There was a time where I would have said, oh no, it, it's got to be. Until I realized that when I was saying that, out of my own ignorance, I was forcing myself to have to pronounce which one of these was what. Mm 
You see the problem there. Okay? Now you go home and you look it up in a 1611 and you'll see that the 1611 doesn't have the word both in it and the 1769 does. Okay? Fred? Going back to the Psalm 12 there, if, if it's purified in the silver seven times, uh, then that would have to apply to every language. Yeah, and we're getting to that. I appreciate your, Fred, you're thinking with a great amount of foresight on this. So, in her, let me just give you an example of this. In her booklet, The Hidden History of the English Scripture Given by Inspiration to All Generations, commemorating the 400th anniversary of the King James, Gail Ripplinger includes a section titled Purified Seven Times, Not Eight. Okay? Now, whatever awkwardness is in this reading, it's there at her behest, not mine. I double and triple checked this to make sure I copied it right. Okay? She said, quote, the King James translators would not approve of any further tampering with the English Bible. The King James translators did not see their translation as one in the midst of a chain of ever-evolving English translations. Now that might be true, but let's read on. They wanted their Bible to be one of which no one could justly say it is good except this word or that word. Now let me just say, that is a highly engineered statement and if you go back and read the preface, you'll see she is not giving you the whole, the whole statement. Okay? So I'm talking about the preface to the 1611. So they, uh, where, did I, where did I go? They wanted their Bible to be one of which no one could say, no one could justly say, it is good except this word or that word. They planned to make out of many good ones, Wycliffe, Tyndale, Coverdale, Great Bible, Geneva Bible, and Bishops, one principal good one, not justly to, not justly to be expected against, that hath been our endeavor, that our mark. The translators said that their translation was perfected. Folks, I am telling you, if you read the preface, she is putting words in their mouth and how they use that word perfected. The King James translators' assertion that their edition perfected leaves no work left for a new version translation. translators. The enemy is at war with the Word of God. So, Ripplinger is, I quoted that to show you that she's using this argumentation based upon Psalm 12 to say that that one was what? That that's the perfected one. Okay, Craig? Even if the translators did say it was perfect, they're not inspired. So, no matter what they thought. And she believes that they were. Ripplinger's comments above typify the type of reasoning regarding Psalm 12, 6, and 7 present in much pro-King James literature and teaching. Now, Fred, here's your point. A less extreme view of Psalm 12, 6, and 7 might hold that the verses in question necessitate a sevenfold refinement process in any receptor language in order for God's perfect word to exist in that language. Okay? The dictionary defines a... Now go back to Psalm 12. Just look at what the verse says. Now in the context, is verse 2, 3, and 4 talking about the vain words, the lips of the flyer, and all that double heart, double speak stuff? Okay? So you get to verse 6 and it says, The words of the Lord are what? Are the words of the flatterer and, so, and, and the one speaking vanity and so forth in verse 2, 3, and 4? Are those pure words? No. The words of the Lord are pure, verse 6, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified what? Seven times. Okay, the dictionary defines a simile as a comparison between two things using the words like or as. Psalm 12, 6 contains a simile to explain how pure God's words are. Okay, how pure are God's words? They're as pure as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified how many times? Seven times. Okay? While I, now this is important everybody hears me, while I believe that Psalm 12, 6, and 7 is teaching the preservation of the words, I do not believe that the psalmist penned these verses with an early 17th century English translation in mind. 
Rather, David is referring to the words that he is in the process of writing in Hebrew. It was those Hebrew words that God preserved, thereby giving the King James translators something to translate into English. This is not to say that translations cannot be part of the preservation process. It simply means that David is not referring to or speaking about the King James in Psalm 12. Okay, Nate? I think it's important to point out, though, in verse 6, when he's talking about that, that statement is a degreed statement. So he's asking basically a question of how pure are God's words? And the key there is are. These aren't, he's not making a future statement about how pure God's words will be one day. They are then. They are right here. They are as pure as silver. Right. So this isn't, you know, he's not making a prediction, obviously, about the King James. He's already, he's stating how pure they are currently. While he's writing it. Boom. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, let's just take stock. I do believe the passages, are, the verses are referring to preservation of the word. I do not think they're talking about the preservation of the people. I do think that some of the things that have been said by pro-King James advocates go too far and are ultimately unhelpful. Okay? Now you're free to agree or disagree with me to whatever degree you, you, you're comfortable with. Okay? But I'm just saying I do believe these, this passage is referring to the preservations of the words, not the people. I think the King James reading stands. I don't buy the arguments about gender discordance and the fact that it's the preservation of the people. Okay? We are almost five minutes past time yet again. We need to quit. I appreciate your attention. Now, we won't have class again next week because we're going to be preempted by the Bible conference. So there will be a Bible conference study next week at 9 a.m. So again, we'll be on a two-week hiatus on this particular study.